hope you don't, Helen said, talk to, to us about whatever you feel is the right thing to talk about and what you'd like to talk about. And I hope you don't feel the fact that we're talking about COVID-19 still um, to be a disappointment. But I thought I would talk about COVID-19 and psoriasis because whilst it's obviously filled our lives for the last year or more um, and it's had a huge impact um, and we've learned a great deal about COVID-19 specifically in relation to psoriasis. I wanted to talk about it for that reason, but also I think that it's taught us very important lessons uh, for how we, what we know about psoriasis and how we should be looking after people with psoriasis, um, even well beyond uh, COVID-19. And whilst it's been the most dreadful, dreadful period, I think um, everyone's had very different experiences, but unanimously bad in many, many ways. I actually feel optimistic about the future and I hope you'll, you'll feel the same at the end of, at, at the end of this um, presentation. But just thinking back now in January 2020, and this was an article that appeared in Nature, and it seems when you read this uh, that really we had absolutely no idea what was going to hit us. And it didn't really register, certainly in clinical practice or amongst clinicians in the UK at the beginning of January. It was just in the background. But things very rapidly changed. And as we all know now, um, even in the UK, this is data from the WHO dashboard. And if you're interested in numbers, this is a very user-friendly interactive dashboard that you can see live data being uploaded all the time. We've now got over a four and a half million cases confirmed um, in the UK alone and um, over 125,000 deaths. But back in March and March the 16th in particular, this is when our Prime Minister announced to everyone, now is the time for everyone to stop non-essential contact and travel. And it was about that time that really the coming impact of, of, of this pandemic was really registering with us as um, clinicians as, as, as to what it might mean. And there was almost no information coming out or published about this disease, about this infection. And one of the first to be published was in The Lancet. And this was a collection of cases of just under 200 people who'd been admitted to hospital in China back, in, um, back at the beginning of the pandemic. And this was really all the information that the community had. And so I wrote, it's, it's interesting to look back, I wrote to him via email on the 16th of March, on that same day that Boris Johnson made that announcement, and was in response to the urgent need to find out information. And with respect to psoriasis in particular, and in the area that I'm involved in, looking after people with more severe disease requiring systemic immunosuppression, this was the very urgent um, question. Were these individuals at major risk from this infection? And I, I emailed him asking that exact question. Were any of the patients that you admitted to hospital in that cohort um, taking immunosuppressants? Um, and um, he, he emailed back by return. And that's one of the things that's been extraordinary about this pandemic, the way that the global community has come together and communicated. Um, and that is something I think is a really important legacy from this COVID um, uh, pandemic. And he responded saying, no, none of the people. And actually at the time, in the absence of any information, and it indicates how very little we knew, this to me was reassuring. Um, but obviously it's a small number of people. So um, these were the questions that were coming from people with psoriasis in clinic every day. 
um, very obvious. Am I more likely to get the infection? Should I stop my treatments? Will I get severe disease? Are any of the treatments more risky than others? Um, how can I get to see you without coming to the hospital? And actually, as Nick indicated, I've been involved in guideline development for over 20 years. And the um, basis of guidelines is evidence, bringing high quality evidence through to the guidelines, through to recommendations for best practice. And so in this situation, it was very difficult. I found it personally very challenging. We had no information, we had no evidence, and yet there was this urgent need um, to, to provide information and guidance to people with psoriasis um, and the clinical community. The questions that patients were asking were exactly the same as the ones that we wanted addressed, that we were asking, who is at risk? What are the determinants of poor outcomes to COVID-19? Does having psoriasis per se increase your risk? What are the risks of immunosuppression? How do we look after, we've got around 5,000 patients under our care, how do we look after those people with psoriasis when at the same time we were asked by our directorate to redeploy 50% of our, of, our, of our staff within the next four weeks in order to manage the onslaught of um, inpatients coming with COVID-19. And what should we tell people? What should we tell our, our patients? And one of the things is when you're, which, which became very clear is, is that in order to address those very fundamental important questions, you really had to focus. You really had to focus on what was most important and at the same time get rid of everything that wasn't important. Um, and an absolute necessity to collaborate with others. So collaborating with other people, um, dealing with chronic inflammatory diseases, we use um, the same drugs, could we um, harness and uh, work together to quickly um, answer questions um, in, 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 in the most expedient um, way possible. And I must say that working with the Saras Association, as well as a number of other global patient organisations, has been a really fantastic um, and important um, learning um, opportunity and something, again, going forward that, that will be very valuable. And it's been, you know, I think a very productive um, relationship. And I feel in a way in the last year, we've had a sort of lifetime of learning and development um, all pressed into one year. So what I'm going to go through now is what have we actually learned about the impact of COVID-19 on people with psoriasis? How has it changed pathways of care for people with psoriasis? And what's for the future? What are the future opportunities? And how important it is not to waste this op these opportunities? So as you all, I'm sure, know, um, for most people, COVID-19 is not a majorly um, threatening, uh, life-threatening condition. Um, most people have mild to moderate disease and recover. But we do know um, that it's estimated and it does depend on the population that you're looking at. But generally, around 15% are described as having so-called severe disease and maybe 5% critical life-threatening organ dysfunction. And the aspects of the condition that cause that are this viral pneumonia, which leads to acute respiratory distress where um, the lungs just aren't working, and then multi-organ failure, um, sepsis, where the body um, really just goes into shock, and then this other complication where you get excess clotting. And the estimated death rate, again, it does depend a bit on what population and the, the, the health services that are around, and it's probably now lower than this because we've subsequent to the initial pandemic understand the disease better have better treatments so this um, estimate of 0.06 percent death rate um, is is probably lower now and 
The other thing that we understand about COVID now is that there are um, phases of the, of, of the disease. So from the time of onset um, for, of the disease, um, and I don't know whether you can see my pointer, but um, there's this pre-symptomatic uh, phase, um, and then the virus starts uh, replicating, and they're most infectious, and then that replication goes away, and most people recover. The body's own immune resources come into play, get on top of the virus, and the person recovers. But in a subset of people, that process doesn't seem to work well. The immune system itself starts working against the body and is on overdrive. And that's when patients progress to more severe illness and poorer outcomes. And so thinking about this phased uh, part of it, the illness where you've got viral replication and then um, it goes away and then progression of inflammation. When we're thinking about um, the treatments in particular uh, that we use for more severe psoriasis, it's, it's, you can imagine um, theoretically those drugs might have differential effects depending on where in the phase the, the, the person is taking. So they might be um, problematic at the beginning, um, but perhaps be helpful if you've got too much inflammation, maybe those Im immunosuppressants might be actually helpful. And then we also know that people with psoriasis, the immune system is slightly skewed um, uh, actually towards um, being extra good at, at fighting viral infection. So maybe having psoriasis may be beneficial, um, but equally there are other pathways that aren't so good. So really there was a question about the psoriasis and then the treatments that we um, use. And so as Nick mentioned at the beginning, and it's... Um, amazing to me in fact thinking back that um, from the time of realizing and that really was the time around the 16th um, and just at the beginning of March really that we needed this information um, three weeks later we were able to launch this registry calling out to the global community looking after people with psoriasis to tell us about their patients who have had COVID um, tell us about uh, what type of um, psoriasis they had, um, what, what were their age, their comorbidities, um, what treatments they were taking and how they responded to the infection. And we launched this registry. We had um, uh, support, huge and important support from the Psoriasis Association. And this was a, a collaborative effort between here, um, at Guy's and St. Thomas's and, and St. John's, uh, Manchester, the Psoriasis Association, and then key people across the global community um, uh, contributing to this effort. While we were curing this information, and as you know, we provided information based on theoretical assumptions and based on what we knew about infections in general, non-COVID, people with psoriasis who were on uh, immunosuppressants were asked to be especially careful and some were asked to shield, um, but we really didn't know. But when, when, when this was one of the first really important studies, which has been highly influential in public health policy and also in clinical guidance, um, and this came from the Open Safely um, group. And this is, again, one of the important legacies here in that um, critical electronic health record data was used. The NHS is very well placed to answer these important questions by linking information from GP records, um, from hospital admissions, and from death uh, rates. And they were able very, very quickly to provide very robust information on outcomes to people in the general population. And just to go through this here, just uh, it was posted at the beginning of May. So this is just two months in uh, to when the, hit, when the condition, when the infection hit the UK. So very, very quickly um, for research to come out. And just to spend some time on this. So here um, is the probability of COVID related death on the um, y-axis here. And this is for women and for men. And on the right, um, you can see a list of all the different risk factors that they looked at. So we all know now, and this is where this information came from, that being older is an important risk factor for COVID-19 and um, adverse outcomes, and also um, being uh, male. 
We also found from this data, non-white ethnicity. And if you see here, this is um, uh, the red line, which you're comparing it with. So for ethnicity, compared to being white, if you were uh, mixed, uh, and these were the categories that we used in NHS records, um, South Asian, black, um, then your hazard ratio of death due to COVID-19 would be, if you look down here, if you look at the dot, which is the median um, here, uh, mean um, it's your increased hazard ratio is nearly two times um, those individuals who are non-white. And so the same is also seen here. If people were carrying extra weight or if they had other medical problems here, they've looked at particularly chronic lung disease, which is perhaps not surprising. Here's the hazard ratio here, um, around two times those without lung disease. Um, and then in this study, critically, they also looked and grouped together people with psoriasis in, gen in GP records, people with lupus, and people with rheumatoid arthritis. And the reason they grouped them together was to get enough power to answer that question. Were people with chronic inflammatory diseases at increased risk of COVID-19 death? And what they showed here, again, um, is that there did seem to be an increased risk. Um, but it's important to note that this increased risk, whilst it is definitely there, is nothing like and compared to the size associated with those who, for example, had um, an organ transplant or, um, for example, in compared to those people who were um, over the age of 60. So there is, um, does seem to be a signal. But what we didn't know was, well, was this signal being driven by rheumatoid arthritis and nothing to do with uh, psoriasis or and was it due if it is due to psoriasis, is it due to the medicines that we use to treat it? And actually we are working very closely now with Open Safely um, to ask that exact question. And unfortunately I haven't got the information to give you today, but we will be publishing it and I'll tweet it. We hope in the next couple of weeks, which will be really um, a very um, large data set asking, um, further clarifying the source of this signal. But in the meantime, we have got information from our registry. And what we found in this registry, reassuringly, and the reason on the top left-hand corner, I've put all the names, these are just some of the names involved in the, um, to generating this data. And the important thing was here, that first of all, most people who got COVID-19 fully recovered. This was very, very reassuring to us. And what we also found, as you can see here in this box here, that the risk factors that you see for poor COVID-19 outcomes in the general population are exactly the same in the psoriasis population. So if you have psoriasis and um, you, you, you need to be thinking about the risk factors um, that aren't necessarily your psoriasis, but the other risk factors that might be, there's nothing special about having psoriasis. We also looked at the influence of the drugs that we use. And what we found is that there did seem to be um, a difference between the hospitalization rates in people taking non-biologic -immun immunosuppressants, and that's mainly standard so-called old-fashioned immunosuppressants like methotrexate, compared to the newer biologic treatments. And there are a few things that are very important here. First of all, although the hazard ratio, the odds ratio was increased, um, and this is two, two, nearly three times, um, the confidence about that estimate, there's a very wide confidence interval. That means that there's a lot of uncertainty about how this, in, this the size of this signal. And the other, um, that now that the, the, it is an important finding because in fact, a similar signal was also seen in people um, with inflammatory bowel disease and in people with rheumatology conditions. So um, the fact that biologic therapy um, and that there was a, a difference in the hospitalization rate, but it doesn't necessarily mean that biologics are safer than non-biologic medicines. And that might seem counterintuitive, but actually um, it doesn't. And the reason for that is, first of all, the people on the registry are only a selection. 
And we don't know if the people that dermatologists entered happened to be under closer watch. So, for example, it could be that people with biologic um, on biologic therapies, that clinicians were more worried about them or were in more contact with the people, those people um, compared to, say, people on methotrexate. So that's one possibility. It's just a selection. So there's a big bias that there. And even if the association is true, we don't know whether it's actually the biologic itself that's actually conferring that um, improved outcome or reduced um, level of, of hospitalization. And we know from other sources, including So Protect Me, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that people taking biologics were more stringently shielding. So it could also be that the people with biologics were um, not in contact with the infection, had less viral exposure, and therefore that's the reason, um, because they were keeping away from uh, um, sources of infection, that they were less likely to end up in hospital. So I think the take home message for a, a person with psoriasis taking these medicines is that the important thing is it's over, it's reassuring, and 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 that this is not data that would mean that you, you should be on one or the other treatment. It's very important to um, talk to your doctor. But the, 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 the other key aspect though is that, and it really struck me when I, I had a patient who came into the clinic um, just recently in December, and she explained to me how she'd, she'd, she'd um, had a positive um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 swab because she was due to go and see her grandchildren. And it had been positive and she'd been stringently shielding since March 2020. And even though she was com feeling completely well, she knew she was positive and she went to bed feeling as though she was going to die from COVID-19. And I think this is one of the things, the collateral damage of the pandemic. So these public, what has been the impact of all of the shielding and public health risk mitigation measures, the repurposing of healthcare services and people with psoriasis not able to access care. And then this big concern about the drugs that they may be taking when in fact, these drugs, all the data to date um, is really very reassuring. And this is one of the things that we try to measure and quantify with this um, So Protect Me registry, which we launched in May 2020, asking you uh, what the impact of this of the um, of this of this of the of the pandemic really was this was translated into all these different languages and the UK have been amazing participants and again the Saras Association have been hugely helpful with this we've had now nearly 5,000 participants um, contributing and what we found is perhaps not that surprising, but it is very concerning. Nearly 40% of people contributing had evidence of poor mental health, either um, anxiety uh, or and depression. And the majority of those were women. And we also saw that over 40% reported that their psoriasis had worsened. Um, you can see here, this is um, here with the number of participants. So 18,000 people uh, out of this group. And when we looked to see what the drivers of that were, people were more likely to get worse psoriasis if they'd been shielding, if they carried extra weight, if they were female, if they were depressed or anxious, and most importantly, if they stop taking their psoriasis medication. And this whole issue is about people not, we found that in fact, most of the people who weren't taking their psoriasis medication were because they were concerned about the adverse effects of that treatment on their risk of COVID-19. And we now know that really this is not a big risk factor for your outcome. So um, these are all incredibly important um, take home messages for clinicians um, looking after people um, with psoriasis. And this has got its way into um, guidelines for clinicians. So in answer to those questions at the moment, just to summarize, what we do know now is that the risk factors that drive outcomes in um, COVID-19, poor outcomes, and poor outcomes means death, um, ITU admission, if you're older, if you're a male, if you're non-white ethnicity, and actually the drivers to that are, are complicated. I'd, I'd be very happy to answer some more, have a bit more discussion about that. 
and or if you have other medical problems. And we know that the systemic treatments that we use for psoriasis in the main are not the most important risk factors for severe outcomes. And it's probably how much immunosuppression, if you're on lots of therapies, um, that, um, and, and the, uh, rather than you know, single agent therapy, uh, really does um, is, are the factors to think about. What has the, been the impact of COVID-19 on how we look after people with psoriasis? Well, again, very early on in the pandemic, NICE, um, I was working with many others on an update on the COVID-19 rapid guideline when we're looking after people with skin conditions and also particularly the drugs that we use. And we, these bullet points came up. And of course, the ones in black, such as does, is the treatment really needed? Um, are you using the least risky one? Can you give it in a, in, a, in a better way? Those are all relevant outside the pandemic. But what it really made us do is focus on whether the monitoring that we were doing was feasible and also was it necessary? And this caused me anyway to really reflect on what we've been doing pre-pandemic. And I came to the conclusion we're probably doing too much, too frequently in too many people that we needed to be more targeted to those really at risk. And so we developed a rationalized monitoring protocol, which was endorsed by NICE, which I believe will endure beyond NICE to the benefit of people with psoriasis. And the other thing that we've done, and again, in a crisis, you have to be creative, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we had to suddenly think about how we were going to manage our patients with much, much reduced resources. And we've been working on rationalizing this uh, review protocol actually pre-pandemic and have been developing a digital tool. And what we did was implement it really that rapidly. And I say we, but it, and it was a collective effort, but actually Rick Wolf really, he's one of our consultants really led on this. And he um, introduced this digital pre-assessment tool. Um, patients were sent a, a, a link, they filled it in, they filled in how their psoriasis was doing um, and what drugs they were taking, whether they'd run out of their uh, medication. They submitted all of that to us and then we reviewed it and it allowed us to really ensure we in, uh, maintain supply, but also that we could stratify our patient groups to make sure we really saw the people uh, that we really needed to see. And equally, those who didn't need to come to the hospital didn't need to come. And as I say, this revised pathway, we feel that people who are doing well, we hardly need to see at all as long as we keep in touch. Um, but those who, who do need to be seen, we'll see. So these are the lessons I think that we've learned from COVID-19 that are so fundamental that we need to look at the whole person. Holistic care is so essential and it's really been flagged that perhaps some individuals have really suffered a lot more than others and we need to repurpose and think about that when we're delivering care. And that the risks of immunosuppression and so on relate to the person you're treating, the person who's taking the medication. Do they have other comorbid problems? Are they older? These sorts of questions, as much as it does to the drug um, and the context. And that most importantly, the benefits of effective treatment are very easy to forget. Everyone was very focused about the risks of COVID-19. And perhaps we were forgetting that if you don't treat the psoriasis properly, that is going to produce important suffering as well. And that we need to be constantly thinking about how we're delivering care and pathways need to um, develop. And so what for the future? Um, one of the really wonderful things, and I, I say that with due, due care because COVID has not been wonderful in any other sense, has been though the way we've managed and enabled engagement with um, patients, the public and professions really in a global way, um, having to do things online and also having to work together in order to generate information has driven real innovation and development in how we interact. So we've done lots of um, webinars, uh, videos. I've learned how to use Twitter um, 
that uh, the, the Saras Association has been a major help um, in terms of generating information and infographics to try and communicate research findings rapidly, quickly, so it's understood about by the target, target area. Um, and um, the, 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 the um, drive to really bring research findings right into the clinical practice so quickly you know the trajectory from discovery to making a difference in clinic it's been extraordinary um, during the pandemic and there are real things that we need to take forward with all, all research and the other thing is the power of the patient voice that data that we got through so protect me has been absolutely invaluable in terms of how we configure our services, what we've learned about the impact um, of psoriasis and continues to. So for example, we're collecting information about vaccines, vaccine response and adverse effects to psoriasis. And so we want to use your the psoriasis citizen scientists to help us ask and answer those key research um, priorities in psoriasis well beyond um, COVID. And the platform that we've developed, So Protect Me, for COVID, we want to reconfigure um, and develop in order to answer all of those um, different questions. And we also, as, as I think you, um, I hope you got the idea of how health records um, that are sitting, that data that's sitting in your health record, in your NHS record, in your GP record, um, can, be, can be linked with individual patient um, data without any, without any risk of breaching confidentiality. And so we, we, we hope that by linking all of this data um, and enabling that, and also perhaps even um, patient self-sampling, we've seen the power of that um, in COVID, people taking their own swabs, their own blood samples to check for whether or not they're carrying COVID, for example, that self-sampling strategy um, can be, um, and taking blood um, by the person themselves can be employed to collect blood to answer other questions to collect, for example, um, your DNA to answer uh, questions around genetic um, susceptibility to conditions and actually the wonderful opportunity to look at how our genes and what we're made of interact with um, the environment. And so um, we are going to be hopefully or well, planning to work in that way. And this is where the Psoriasis Association is absolutely core to this endeavor because the Psoriasis Association has um, provided absolutely essential funding now to support this platform and its um, related study, Biomarkers of Systemic Treatment Outcomes in Psoriasis, um, for the next five years, for us to really harness all of this in order to try and address some of these really key research priorities that the psoriasis community have identified as part of the James Lind Alliance. So with this, for example, longitudinal reporting, you as, as patients with psoriasis can tell us about your lifestyle over time, diet, alcohol, smoking, weight loss, um, exercise, uh, uh, environmental pollution, all of those sorts of things we can start collecting in a very, um, a very detailed way uh, together with your genetic makeup, the genetic makeup, and start trying to unpick some of these really critical questions. Um, so this is really such a, an exciting and important uh, opportunity. And really that the Saras Association funding is absolutely fundamental to this. So um, uh, it, it's a really the most wonderful thing to have that secure funding for the next five years to enable us to, to plan um, and really prosecute um, some of this uh, critical uh, research. And COVID-19 has shown us that we really can do it. So as I said at the beginning, I feel optimistic um, and I'm very happy. Uh, this is, this is, a, this is um, a painting from David Hockney, which, which, uh, which I think properly illustrates uh, how things are changing. And I'd be really very happy to answer any questions. And just finally to say thank you very, very much. I mean, I've highlighted here all the people that were involved in So Protect and So Protect Me, but these also um, are um, key uh, collaborators here down 
on, on the right hand side. So that's really all I was going to say and I, I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you.